channeling my inner Danny Gonzalez and drinking a LaCroix. Bottoms up. Hi friends, welcome back, or just welcome if you're new. My name is Emily and today we're gonna chat about the Shadow and Bone series by Lee Bardugo. Now just to start things off honestly, I know I'm super behind on this. The Shadow and Bone series started coming out in 2012 and this is my first time reading it, but I wanted to read this series before the Netflix show came out, which I'm super excited for and more excited for it now that I have read this series, so figured it was high time. Actually, funny story about this whole Grishaverse Six of Crows Shadow and Bone thing. I read the Six of Crows duology before I read this trilogy because I didn't know that the Shadow and Bone trilogy even existed. I started reading Six of Crows and then I was kind of confused by the world. I was like, hmm, what's going on? Did I miss something? So I looked it up and turns out I missed three whole books, which I don't know how that can happen, but I, it did. I read the duology all the way through before I read this series, but we're here now, so it doesn't really matter how I got here. This series was actually really incredible. I really, really liked it. I know this tends to be a really divisive series, like you either love it or you hate it, but I would say that I fall more on the love side. I really, really enjoyed this. I think I'm just going to go ahead and skip the summary part of this video because pretty much everyone has read this series already, so there's really no need for me to summarize. And I think I'm also going to skip the spoiler section of this video because if I try to do non-spoilers for like each book, then the non-spoilers for one book would be spoilers for the one before that. So let's just jump right into the spoilers. Let's go. So Shadow and Bone. I felt like this book moved really fast. At the point that I was reading it, I wasn't even comparing it to the other two books, obviously, because I hadn't read them yet. And those two books move a lot slower than this one does, but I just felt like there wasn't a lot of space to breathe, if that makes any sense. There weren't breaks in between the action, which is like fine. And it could totally have been a storytelling tactic where we're supposed to go on this whirlwind journey as if we were Alina and try to figure things out as Alina figures them out, but it didn't really come off that way. But I mean, I'm not trying to criticize it or anything. It was, I liked the pacing. It was just faster than I expected it to be. Also, okay, it's really hard to film this right now and just try to talk about this book without talking about my knowledge from the other two because there's so much foreshadowing and there are so many little things that tie together throughout all of the books. There's a lot of foreshadowing in this book, especially with Bagra and the Darkling, which I thought was a really cool storyline. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Just super cool stuff. Lee Bardugo is like a master at foreshadowing and character development and dialogue. And you know what? I think we'll just leave it at that she's an incredible author. Because, I mean, really, really. Back to more specifics about the content of Shadow and Bone. When I read this, I loved Mel. I thought, knight in shining armor, perfect guy, him and Alina fit together so well. 100% just great. But I think my perspective on Mal changed quite a bit as I continued to read the series. Like in Siege and Storm, absolutely not. I thought he was whiny and irritating and demanding things of Alina that he totally shouldn't demand of her. But then in Ruin and Rising, my opinion started to turn around again and I could kind of see how he had struggled at the little palace and I could see how he was trying his best to give Alina what she needed and how he was thriving or at least not like shriveling up in this new environment and how he was taking charge of his life. I think as YA readers, we tend to read romantic relationships in YA books as a very one-sided thing. So like if character A does something to character B, then automatically character A is the villain and there's no discussion. But we just have to remember that Character A is also a character and they have their own wishes and desires and motivations and flaws and those things have to play out in the actions that they take. Just because they do one not so great thing doesn't mean that they're an all-around terrible person. I really think my perspective on YA has changed as I've grown older. Video topic perhaps? I have a lot of thoughts on it. But I really think that that's what my switch in perspective on Mal really comes down to is just my that kind of change and that realization that yeah, Mal hurt Alina, but he's also his own character. He has his own life. He has his own things to worry about. And it's just kind of giving people the benefit of the doubt. You know what I mean? Shadow and Bone gets three stars for me. It wasn't like knock my socks off good, but it was good. And honestly, it just didn't stack up to the rest of the books. It was a little difficult to warm up to, 
I did get into it eventually, but it seemed a little surface level, but the surface level went away in the next two books. And that brings us to Siege and Storm. This is a possibly controversial opinion, but I think Siege and Storm is my favorite out of the entire series. I know, I know, it's impossibly slow, and I do admit that. Really nothing happened in this book except for like the beginning and the end, but I am such a sucker for the politics and the stolen intimate conversations and the relationship drama and all that like in-betweenness. I used to have this thing where I hated second books in series, but that has turned around now because Again, the second books are full of that in-betweenness. That's so much fun for me. I love reading stuff like that. And I think that kind of translates into my writing too. Like I like writing action and setting the scene and all that stuff. But if I could just write snappy dialogue and political intrigue all day, 100%, I would do that. And you know, who better to learn from than the master of dialogue herself, Lee Bardugo. I know I talked about this already, but that woman is a wizard. She's incredibly talented. Okay, I think I've gone long enough without talking about Nikolai Lansov. <laughs> I love him. New favorite character without a doubt. He's like sarcastic and witty and charming, but he's also really cunning and smart and strategic. He's got a sharp tongue, but he's heartfelt. I just, wow. Once again, Lee Bardugo just knocked it out of the park with Nikolai. Incredible, amazing. Cue that Lady Gaga video where she's like show-stopping, amazing, incredible. That's, that's Nikolai. I really, really loved his Sturmhahn persona. Fun fact about me, pirates are kind of my jam. I've been fascinated with like the golden age of piracy for a really long time and my current like work in progress is really heavily inspired by that era. So pirates are like on my brain all the time. And so any literature that I can pick up that has pirates in it is pretty cool. So basically just a really long winded way of saying that I really liked Nikolai as a pirate. <laughs> Siege and Storm is also when I really started to kind of fall in love with Alina. I can confidently say that she's one of my favorite protagonists that I've read in like a really, really long time. One of the places that I marked that really gave me that like little ding of reality kind of from Alina is when uh, Fedyor and some of the other Grisha arrive at, I believe it was the Grand Palace, when Alina is standing in the garden and she's being told by like Tolia and Tamar and Mal to just kind of stay back. But then we get this from her. Part of me bridled at being told to run off and hide my head, but I didn't want to be stupid either. A traditional YA protagonist, as I'm sure we all know, would just kind of rush into things headlong without a second thought. But Alina has second thoughts. She has doubts. She has reservations. I talked about this a little bit in my Unearthed video last week, but that's important to have, that duality between being unsure of yourself but also being confident in yourself, because that's real. That's what makes your protagonist relatable. Like, sure, we love the hero with no fear, but we also want to see ourselves in literature. That's what makes it personal. And seeing characters act like we would act or do what we would do, there's just something special about that. Siege and Storm is five stars. No question. I know that it was slow, but I'm gonna overlook the pacing because what did happen in this book was awesome, and the waiting was awesome too. And finally, Ruin and Rising. I loved this book. I loved the pacing, which was a little faster than Siege and Storm. I loved the relationships. I loved the twists. I loved the conclusion. And I know that's another polarizing thing. A lot of people are upset that Alina lost her power in the end, which I do admit seemed to come out of nowhere, but I think it's kind of a fitting and again, realistic <laughs> conclusion to Alina's story. Not everything works out for the hero. Not everything stays intact. And that results in a bittersweet ending, which I'm a sucker for. That epilogue almost brought me to tears. You'll always be one of us. How can you not love that? This book is where we really saw Alina's descent into darkness and wow, it was bone chilling at times. Like there's this one quote from after Alina and company kind of overcome the apparat and the kettle and we get this from Alina. I looked at the apparat. I felt the dark urge to humble him, to make him crawl in front of me for these long weeks of subjugation underground. Like, wow, that's really dark. Also, Alina becomes so much more of a badass in this book. Like, not that she wasn't before, but we really get to see it here. Like when she says to the apparat, you are on your knees, we are not negotiating. Wow, that's incredible. I love Alina Starkov so much. <laughs> However, this book also let us see the other side of Alina, like the scared side and the tentative side and the vulnerable side. The scene where Alina comes out of her contact with the Darkling when he shows her Karamzin and all of the ladies kind of cluster around Alina and try to comfort her is a really good example of this. Alina breaks down sometimes. She falls apart. She doesn't know what to do. She gets hopeless. 
and that's what makes her real. I will say this until I die, Alina is such a real character and I love that about her. I loved the Grisha crew, like Jenya, David, Tolia, Tamar, Nadia, Adric, is that it? Zoya. How could I forget Zoya? 11 out of 10. Fantastic. I loved how they all used their gifts and skills and powers in different ways, especially that entrance into the shadow fold at the end of the book. That was really quite iconic. And I also loved their back and forth. They gave me kind of found family vibes, which is yet another thing that I'm a sucker for. And finally, I feel like I should talk about the Darkling because I like haven't talked about the Darkling this whole time. Honestly, I was very intrigued by the Darkling. Like his whole backstory with Begra and Morozova and the amplifiers, that was really cool. And all of the twists in that storyline were also very awesome. The one with Mal, I totally didn't see coming, although I probably should have because literally all the clues were right there. I just wasn't looking. I was really into the, well, dark, vibes of the Darkling. He really did seem dangerous and cruel, and that's what you want in a villain, obviously, but he wasn't so dangerous and cruel that I just totally wrote him off as just like the worst character ever. Like He was really interesting and he had depth, and he was a sympathetic villain. Ruin and Rising is four stars. I really, really loved this book, but not quite as much as Siege and Storm, probably because there wasn't enough Nikolai in it. So for the quote portion, I really don't know if it's possible for me to pick a favorite quote out of this entire series, but I can share one that just made my heart melt. Right before Mal and Alina have like an intimate night before the final battle in Ruin and Rising, Mal says to Alina, you are all I've ever wanted. You are the whole of my heart. Now, if that isn't the most romantic thing you've ever heard, like seriously, I just dissolved when I read that. It's so beautiful and tender and sweet. Just, I loved it. It was so good that's what I have on the Shadow and Bone series. If you made it to the end of this video, congratulations for making it through my rambling and also thank you. <laughs> I'm so much more excited to watch the Netflix series now that I've read this trilogy and also now I'm inspired to do a reread of the Six of Crows duology, so I might talk about that in videos in the future. We'll see. But for now, thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you so choose and I will see you next time. Happy reading!